Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2018. Welcome to the future. Talking to an 11 year old girl in the first service, she said, I can't believe it's 2018. You were born in 2006. <laughs> Come back when it's 2050 and say, You can't believe it's 2050. You oh, man. Well, I, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank you for, for rallying at the end of the year and, and, and for putting things in place that make me very optimistic about where we're headed. Uh, the, and, it, and it's not just the financial pieces, it's, it's, it's the willingness to put yourself out there, the willingness to serve, the willingness to go and, and, and work uh, to help others and to, and to reach out beyond this campus. This last year was an amazing year. And, it, and I wanted to thank you for that. It's because of the faithfulness of this family of faith that I think the pieces of the vision of, of this ministry are coming together. And as we ended this year, you, you kind of affirmed that. that. Our entire congregation affirmed, this is the way we want to go. We want to keep going this way. And so I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. I can't predict what's going to happen in 2018, and I'm sure there will be things that are unexpected as there were in 2017 that we don't enjoy, and some things that are unexpected that we, that we celebrate. But I'm optimistic about where we're headed because the pieces are coming into place, and it feels really good, and I wanted to thank you for that. And I want to continue that sort of uh, proactive, aggressive, expression of the quest that we're on. I want us to go wider and I want us to go deeper. And so I wanted us to start today. I want to start wrestling with some of the harder things, some of the, some of the, some of the deeper things. And so today I wanted us to wrestle with the idea of, of how do faith and science come together? Is it a collision or is it a collaboration? And I wanted to hang our toes over the edge of the precipice and, and, and dive into the deep end, to the difficult, thoughtful discussions. But I need the help. Is anybody here a puzzler? Anybody do puzzles? Maybe like a fan of puzzles? You like a puzzle person? And I'm not talking you go to your grandmother's house and there's nothing else to do, so you do puzzles. I know that's usually where you wind up doing puzzles because you're bored silly, but she has a puzzle, so you do a puzzle. Well, if, if you're a puzzler, then you understand where we're going. Because, because puzzle people, puzzle people look, look at this. 1,500 pieces of chaos. They look, they look at a box of a puzzle and they go, Oh, that's so good. I can't wait to see how these fit together. The rest of us, who are normal, <laughs> look at this and go, why would someone take a perfectly good picture and cut it into 1,500 tiny ridiculous little pieces and say, here, it's like going to Ikea. And they say, here's your furniture. It would be like going to Nordstrom and say, I want to buy a sweater, and they hand you a ball of yarn and two needles. They say, here, here's the sweater. But this is where faith and science meet, and if you're a puzzle person, you'll understand this perfectly. Because I want to suggest today that not only are faith and science pieces in the same puzzle, there are actually two sides of the same piece. But before we go into the deep end, before we dive in, I think it's best if we pray. So would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to challenge us, to educate us, inform us, to uh, remind us that there are good people who disagree with us, who look at life differently, Pray that we might have our eyes opened and our minds uh, sort of stretched. Pray that for myself and for my family and for all of us here. May we hear you today. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith and science collide in, in uh, the very first words of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, in the opening sentence of the Bible, it says God created the heavens and the earth, and faith and science 
collide and come into conflict. The battle lines are drawn right there in the opening phrase of the Bible. And that's where we want to begin. We want to begin there at the beginning. But before, before we get into that, I need, I need to make something perfectly clear. I need to make sure that you all understand where I'm coming from. Because I'm biased. I'm prejudiced. I'm, I'm not objective at all. You see, I am, I, I am a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. I've committed my life to that. I've committed my life to studying his ways and studying his teaching and to, and to try as inept as I am, to, to follow his leading, to make sense of the universe through him. And, and so I don't, I don't have, I don't have a, a clean slate. I don't have a tabla rasa. I don't, I don't have an unprejudiced view. I have, I have a prejudicial perspective because I believe that Jesus is exactly who the Bible says he is. And while I revere the Bible, while I, while I respect the Bible, while I believe that the Bible is unlike any other book in all of human literature, that it was produced and protected supernaturally, I do not worship the Bible. There's a difference. There's a difference between respecting it and revering it and not worshiping it. So, but, but the Bible for me is an instrument. It's an instrument like, like an electron microscope or the Hubble telescope or, or a CAT scan. It gives me data that I could not otherwise discover. It shows me things that I otherwise could not see. But that data is not benign. That data needs interpretation. And the battle lines are, for me, on how you understand what the Bible is saying. Just so you understand that that's my prejudice. I'm coming at this from, from a biased point of view, which is what makes what happens in the book of Genesis, particularly in the first chapter, so challenging for someone like me. Because in Genesis chapter 1, it describes for us six days in which God created everything that exists. In the first day, he says, let there be light. And there was light, the morning and evening, the first day. That, that's what Genesis says, how creation began, with God saying, let there be light. And the second day, it tells us that God separated the waters from the chaos, and he called the part sky, and he put the waters. It's like he created the heavens and the earth. He created the, the space and, and the planets. Then on the third day, it says that, that he created dry land among the waters of the earth. And on that land, he put uh, vegetation and living, living plants that were seed-bearing plants that would reproduce. He created life. On the fourth day, it says he created the sun and the moon and the stars to make the difference between the night and the day. On the fifth day, it says that he created the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. And on the sixth day, creation was completed. And that was the day that he created livestock and wild beasts and, in his own image, mankind. And he goes on to say that he created man in his image. He created them in his maleness and in his femaleness. He created us in his image, and it was very good. And faith and science come into conflict. Now, now the scientists and me can get through the first three days I get through the first three days, but I get to the fourth day, and it's on the fourth day, after the earth is created, after there are, are seed-bearing plants created, that he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the physics don't support that. They just don't. You can't, you can't have a planet. You can't have days without the sun and the moon and the stars. I mean, how did the fourth day get to be the fourth day? It should have been like the second day. And so, so things don't start adding up. And, and our faith and our science start to try to figure out, okay, how do the pieces fit together? Well, today I want to give you seven theories. Seven theories that most people would agree with one or a few of them on how to bring their faith and science together. Particularly, how do you look at Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story in light of empirical scientific method? First two are probably the most prominent. They are, they, are the, they are the theories that are most widely held, and they are the most combative. 
They are the people who believe in a literal six-day creation. That God created the heavens and the earth in six 24-hour days. As opposed to that, there are people who believe in atheistic evolution. Because of the scientific evidence, they say, not only is the Bible discredited, there, there is no evidence in the universe of God. I cannot find it empirically, scientifically. And we have a tendency to think that these two people are exact opposites. But I want to suggest to you that they are brothers from different mothers. They are two of the same persons. That they are actually two sides of exactly the same argument. And the reason that I say that is because they are both, the atheistic evolutionists and the literal six-day creationists, are both dogmatic in their epistemology. If you had a basic philosophy 101 class, you understand that epistemology is sort of the 20th century philosophical wanderings of uh, people who have nothing better to do than think about how we think. And basically, epistemology is the conversation about how do we know what we know? And it's pretty much a 20th century construct, even though some people trace it back to Descartes and, you know, I think, therefore I am, or even Aristotle or Plato. But really, what epistemology is, is epistemology is the consideration of what is the difference between what I know and what I believe. Because knowing something and believing something are different things. And epistemology says, how do we know what we know? And both the six-day creationist and the atheistic evolutionist are dogmatic in their epistemology. The six-day creationist says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. The atheistic evolutionist says, the evidence proves it, I believe it, that settles it. They're saying the same thing. One of them is saying that with God, one of them is saying it without God. If you don't agree with me, listen to any famous or influential atheistic or agnostic scientist, like a Neil deGrasse Tyson or a Carl Sagan or a Bill Nye the Science Guy or a Richard Dawkins. And count how many times in a lecture they will use the word believe. They cannot get through a description of their position without saying, I or we believe this. I have come to the conviction that science is in fact a religious system because it requires belief in the empirical evidence. It requires that I believe in the science. And the high priests of science and of, of the scientific method and of the empirical study say this is how we know what is true because we can prove it. And once they sufficiently provide the evidence, then you believe it. It's no different than a life of faith. Here is the evidence. You choose to believe it or not. These two people are pretty much the same person. Uh, does it sound like I'm running them down? Because I don't mean to. Because I am this person. I am, I am the cynic. I am the skeptic. I am, I am the person who says, show me, prove it to me. I want evidence. Don't just tell me that this is true. Show me that it's true. So I understand the conflict. I understand the, the passion of the six-day creationist. I understand that they want order. They want the world to make sense. They want the Bible to be absolutely infallibly true. I get that. Both of these are legitimate points of view. There are people here today, I'm sure, who would say, yeah, that's me, or that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm been there, done that, am there. The next two positions are sort of slight modifications, compromises of these two. This one is called the day age creationist and the other is called a theistic evolutionist
And both of those positions are basically a compromise from the dogmatic epistemology of the first two. Because they're, they deal with the, the most difficult inconsistencies in those positions intellectually and, and logically. The, the day-age creationist deals with the difficulty of the geology, the difficulty of the science. The, the 24-hour days are, are not scientifically possible because, because the evidence shows that, that the, the universe has existed for billions and billions of years. So the day-age creationist says, well, the 24-hour days are not 24-hour days. Nobody had a watch. Nobody could measure it. So, so an a, a day is an epoch. It is, a, is an age. And that age could be billions of years. God spoke and said, let there be light. And that could have been a billion years. The theistic evolutionist deals with the greatest problem of atheistic evolution, which is the problem of ex nihilo. Ex nihilo is Latin for out of nothing, from nothing. What was the uncaused first cause? The greatest problem of atheistic evolution is where did it all come from? If there was a time when there was nothing, and then there was a time when there was something, whether there was a Big Bang or string theory or however you view it, the theistic evolutionist says, well, God's the one that lit the fuse. God is the idea that is eternal and infinite. Carl Sagan, even though he wasn't a theist, actually granted the universe deity. Because he says the cosmos is all that was and all that is and all that ever will be. Anything that's infinite and eternal is deity. So he made the cosmos as God. Because it was the uncaused first cause, but it doesn't explain it. So these two positions compromise the first two and, and, and come, try and come to terms with the Genesis story and say, well, you know, God was involved in creation, but at a distance. He lit the fuse. He, he, he got it started. He pushed the thing into motion. Or God was involved in, in, this, in this theory of ages. Now, these are all four good points of view. I'm sure there are people in our congregation today who, who think, who embrace these. Say, yeah, well, I kind of like this. I kind of like this. I'm that. The next two are, are two theories that... I kind of made up. <laughs> and one of them, and, and this one is called the created with the appearance of age. And what I mean by that is we're dealing with God here, okay? Can we get our heads around God? God is not like a really smart person. God, God is not subject to the laws of nature. God made the laws of nature. God invented time. So when it says it took him a day to do this, well, he invented the day. So the day is whatever he says it is. And God, God has the ability to create things, being God, if you can imagine an unlimited capacity, to create things that from their existence give off the evidence that they are ancient. The, the story in the book of Genesis does not indicate that the creation took place and Adam and Eve were embryos. They were fully grown men and women. They were created as mature beings. It, it's, it's conceivable in this theory that God created the stars in the heavens, even though it would take billions of years for the, for the light of a star to reach our eyes, God knew that the beauty and the wonder of the universe that God was creating would be enhanced if those stars were already in place. And so at creation, they gave off the appearance that they were in fact billions of years old, when in fact, he created them with the appearance of age, the, the mountains, the God didn't need 24 hours. He didn't need 24 hours to say, let there be light. Can you imagine that? Let... Six hours later, t <laughs> God, we're dealing with God here. God has the ability to make things appear as God wants them to appear. And so when we test them scientifically, oh, this must be a billion years old. Well, sure, I made it to look that way. Because I'm God. 
opposed to that, my second self-invented theory is the theory of the divine watchmaker. And this is a, sort of a, an evolution from atheistic to theistic evolution. The divine watchmaker basically suggests that God is intimately involved with, with the formation of the universe that we live in, with the purpose being that as we study that universe, we get to know God. Like a watchmaker who has a signature movement that they make, when you take apart that watch, you say, well, this was made by that watchmaker. The artist leaves their mark in their art. My daughter Leah is a painter. And when my daughter Leah graduated from art school at UT, um, she started painting for a living and she never signed her paintings. I said, Leah, honey, why don't you sign your paper paintings so people will know who, to ask you to paint so you could, they will buy your paintings. If they don't know who made them, then they can't buy them from you. And she said, Dad, my work is my signature. That if my paintings are not distinctive enough and, and not close enough to my personal vision that you look at it and you go, oh, that's a Leah Haney, then I haven't fulfilled my role as an artist. It's the theory of the divine watchmaker. The divine watchmaker created the universe and said, I am leaving my fingerprints. I am leaving my art for you to know me. When you stand on a beach and you watch a sunrise, when you stand on a mountaintop and you behold the majesty of a mountain range, when you hold an infant and the miracle of life in your hands, it was meant to say, okay, he's, I'm the one that made that. And so all six of these theories kind of move away from that dogmatic epistemology, but there's a seventh theory. And this is, the, this is the hardest one to get a hold on. And it's the one that the fewest people that I know hold to, but it's the one I like. It's called the gap theory. And that has nothing to do with the clothes God wore when he created the universe. Oh, yeah, those are great chinos you had on on the third day. Oh, yeah, it's the gap. <laughs> No, that's not what the gap theory is. What the gap theory says is in Genesis chapter 1, if you look closely at it, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period, end of sentence. That sentence describes the beginning of everything. That sentence is where the creation of everything that is happened. That sentence is the Big Bang. That sentence is the initial work of setting the planets in motion. That, that is attributing to God the divine ex nihilo, creating something from nothing. The uncaused first cause was God. It was Albert Einstein who said, I, I'm, I'm searching for the grand unifying theory. The way he put it is, all I want to know is the mind of God. The rest is just details. By the way, Einstein also said, I believe there are two things that are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the first one. <laughs> but the gap theory basically says that there is a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Because if you look at verse 1, and you consider that verse 1 is the beginning of all things. This was where the, the universe was set into motion, where time and, and space came to be, where something came from nothing. It happened in verse 1. What happens in verse 2? Chaos. It says the, the earth was formless and void. The Hebrew there is the word tohu, Vibohu. It means formless and without void. It means chaos. The earth was chaos. So then verse 1, the, the, the universe was created, and, and that could be billions of years. It could be time immemorial that, that, that the universe that we understand was coming into being. But at some point, the universe went into tobu vibohu. The universe went into chaos. The picture was cut into pieces. Now the problem with the gap theory is why? 
if God created the heavens and the earth and God is a perfect God and God, God makes no mistakes and God is a good God, then how did the world, how did the universe descend into chaos? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next week, which is another one of the deep questions. Where did evil come from? Why is there evil? What is the nature of man's will? But I think the gap theory su suggests something very interesting. It suggests that Genesis chapter 1 is the, not the story of creation, but the story of the restoration of creation order. In fact, the entire narrative of the Bible is the story of the restoration of creation order. That from the tobu vabohu, from the formless and void world, God set all of the pieces necessary for the, for the universe to be restored out in what we have in Genesis chapter 1. And he commissioned us to restore it. Now, none of, none of these theories is foolproof. They all require faith, you see. <laughs> they all have problems. They all have holes. They all have contradictions. They all require standing on the edge and saying, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to believe that there is a God who is able to create the universe in six 24-hour days. I choose to believe that. Or I choose to believe that because God would say that, there is no God. I find no evidence of God anywhere empirically in the universe. And, and you choose to believe. Everyone believes something. No one believes nothing. Even if you believe nothing, you believe that you believe nothing. The circular logic, everyone believes something. The, the, we have to understand, what do you believe? But the more important question is, why do you believe it? Why do you need to believe that there is a God? Why do you need to believe that there isn't a God? What is it about you that says, I, I don't want a God hanging around? I don't want to be subject to a higher power. Or I do, I need a higher power. The why is, is the harder question. But what if? What if the way the universe was designed was as Genesis suggests, that the universe was created by God and then the universe fell into chaos? And, and what if it is our purpose, our mission, we exist, the reason human beings exist is to do the work of God in restoring creation order. What if it is our purpose to heal and not to harm, to restore and not to destroy, to love and not to hate? And that is the mission that God is establishing in Genesis chapter 1. Maybe that, what if, what if that's why the seventh day is the day God rested? In Genesis chapter 2, it says on the seventh day God completed his work and he rested. Was he, did he rest because he was tired? Was God pooped? I mean, I mean, Pluto, oh man, that was way out there. I, I just gotta, I gotta, I gotta sit down for a minute after, after doing that. DNA, oh man, all them little chromosomes, like a million of them, I gotta take a week in the Bahamas just to recover from creating mankind. I mean, that was, a, that was a load of work. No, you know why God rested? What if, what if God rested? Because he was saying to you and me, I have given you the greatest mission I could give anyone. Restoring hope, restoring love, restoring wholeness to brokenness. I have given you that mission. I haven't put you in a world with no meaning, with no purpose. I haven't, I'm, I'm not born into a meaningless, meaningless existence where I'm born and I live and I die and it doesn't matter. I'm born into a world where I am imprinted with the image of God and saying, go about the business of restoring creation order. What if that's what Genesis 1 is about. And all of the pieces that are necessary for the restoration of creation order are right there. Puzzle people here understand that. Puzzle people understand, I understand why you would cut up a perfectly good picture 
I understand why you would cut it up into an infinite number of pieces, because I have felt the satisfaction of finding two pieces in a pile of pieces that go together perfectly. You ever felt that? You ever worked on a puzzle and you're just sitting there and you're like, every piece looks the same and they're all making me crazy. And then you go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'll sit here for another seven hours to see that again. <laughs> and you're just, and how do you build a puzzle? How do you build a puzzle? Well, you start at the edges. Start at the outside. Start at the fringes. Because the edge pieces, the edge pieces are the ones with the straight part. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Got that corner pieces. Beautiful. And then you, then you start saying, oh, look, oh, it was blue. And I'm, I'm going to sort the blues over here. And there's brown down here. I'm going to sort the browns over here. And you, and you start to assemble a picture that makes sense. What if that's what God did? He said, I didn't want to create a world where all you did was autonomously exist. I made you with a purpose, to be a reflection of my redemptive nature to be reconcilers, to be agents of reconciliation. That's why I celebrate science. I celebrate the discoveries, the discoveries of, of, you know, a piece of a bone that's found in Sudan and a piece of a bone that's found in Asia. And they say, this is evidence of ancient civilizations or man or astronomers that point the telescopes into what seemed to be an empty space in the sky and as they, as they analyzed it, they realized, no, what they were seeing behind that emptiness was literally thousands of other galaxies. And the infinite nature and all of those discoveries, because, because they're painting a picture for me. Because you see, how I'm putting the, the puzzle together is I'm looking at the picture. I mean, when you make a puzzle, you sit there and you look up and you go, you look down, you look up, you look down, you look up. I'm looking at the face of Jesus. That's my puzzle. And as I put him together, the universe starts to come together. The pieces of the universe start to make sense. So why would you flip the puzzle over and put the pieces together with no image? Well, you might start to get the pieces together and you might find some that fit together over here and fit together over here. But even once you get the puzzle completely put together, you know what it shows you? Nothing. It just shows you that you can put a puzzle together. It doesn't show you why. I celebrate the science. I celebrate the, the discoveries and the knowledge. And, and I may not agree with the conclusions that come from them, but I, but I see the picture coming together. And that's what I've seen over the last year here with us. I've seen some of the pieces starting to come together as we become agents of reconciliation, as we become a community of people that are about healing and about hope, that are about, that are about reconstruction, not destruction, that are about love and not hate, that are about caring and grace. That's why, that's why I was so encouraged as we finished the year, because I was seeing so many of those pieces come together. It's what I'm looking forward to in the year to come. It's so more of those pieces getting connected and more of his face becoming more clear, not just to me, but to people who really need to make sense of the world that they live in. Thank you for that. Welcome to the future. Welcome to 2018. Happy New Year.